Mr. Doug Foreman's out today, so I'll be doing announcements. And right now, Brother Ferris down in New Orleans, so pray for him at the convention. Pray for the convention that God's will be done. And right now, I'm in charge. Thankfully, <laughs> the church has not burned down. There's no fires. I know he's watching right now. We are missing a light post, but that's not my fault, so I'm not going to explain that. <laughs> so, uh, if you're a guest, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. We have a little card that looks like this should be right in front of you. Fill it out and just drop it off in that offering plate back there. Um, if you can talk about the offering plate, if you have any offerings, you can, when you're leaving today, you can just drop it off back there or go to our website. And there's a little tab that says give. Click it, go, scroll down, and fill out the information, and we're taking the money from there. Uh, <laughs> so we have a big week this week. We have BBS. I'm, hopefully, y'all come help out. It's, it's a great time to serve and just bring joy to these little kids' lives. And so, and Miss Stephanie wants me to tell you if y'all are helping out BBS. After the service, come up to the front and say, Tracy just wants to go over a few things with us. Um, and then, so BBS, so there's no evening service tonight because tonight's the first night BBS and it goes all the way into Wednesday night. And then on June 13th, there's a senior adult Bible study and potluck luncheon. And it's at 10.30 a.m. Cynthia Hall would be from East Arkansas Area Agency on Agent would be all guest speaker. And then June 18th is Father, Father's Day. So if you haven't got your daddy gift yet, go to Academy and get that grill for him. Don't forget about that. There's no evening service on Father's Day. And then June 20th, we're that night we're, from 5 to 7, we're doing a youth game night. So y'all youth, if y'all haven't paid attention to me in church this morning, we're having a youth fire game night. And if you have a youth that you have in your household or you know of, let them come, invite them to come join us. And that's all I have for announcements for now. Uh, and let's go into prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this time to just worship you and to learn more about you. I pray over Brother Rick as he goes to the public sermon. And God just bless this church and be the In the holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's, let's stand and sing. As long as I have you.
is here, nothing eternal ever happens. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's all about His presence. I want to share with you as you turn your Bibles to John chapter 2 this morning, we're going to be speaking about when Jesus goes to a wedding. I asked Brother Ferry what he asked me two weeks ago if I'd preach for him on this day, knowing he would be gone, if I could pick up where he left off last week. And he ended chapter 1 at the end of it last week. 
He said, yes, you have my blessing, and that's why we're here today, because we have his blessing. Uh, Miss Dorothy called the middle of the week and said, what are you preaching on? So I put it in the bulletin, and I gave her kind of the text and the outline, and I said, I'm sure that Brother Farrell will come back when he's here, and he'll preach a real sermon on this issue, <laughs> and I'm sure that he will, so uh, I I'm, glad to, I'm glad for the opportunity. I know how pastors are about trusting someone to fill their pulpits. I know it's sacred to them, and so I'm thankful for the opportunity. Let me say this a moment to you. I don't know if I can adequately tell you how I feel. I love this church. Amen. I literally love this church. We've only been here for just a few weeks, Connie and I. But I have really grown to love this church. And I am so thankful to be a part of your church family. Amen. And I take serious the feeding of the sheep, even when the pastor is away. Amen. 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 So we're going to be looking at John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Stand with me, if you will, for the reading of the word. Verse 1, in the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. We'll look at that in depth a lot later, okay? His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. I thought it was interesting. Nike thought they had coined that phrase first, <laughs> right? <laughs> Mary beat them to it a thousand years ago, okay? Um, and he said... Uh, whatever he says to you, do it. Verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. We'll look at that in a little bit. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw out now and bury it to the governor of the feast. And they buried it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, them, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. The beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory in his disciples, believed on him. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for the power that it has just to read it. Lord, now I pray you help me, hit me of self, fill me with your spirit. Help us to feed your sheep today. And may all that we say be for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus goes to a wedding in John chapter 2. A wedding in these days was the most exciting gala event of all times. Weddings were a blowout back in this day, in this city, in biblical times. Now, most of us go to weddings today, right? Amen? A lot of us go to weddings. I do a lot of weddings, okay? So, weddings today are not hardly anything like weddings back then. I would say it this way. Weddings today... The, br the bride plans the wedding for a whole year. Are you with me? I mean, everything's got to be perfect for the bride on her wedding day, amen? As only it should be so. So she plans for a whole year all the things, the right colors, the flowers, the cake, everything perfect, okay? The father of the bride usually is out 25 to 50 grand. Y'all with me? And then when you come to the day of the wedding, the ceremony only lasts 20 minutes. That's usually the way weddings go in our culture, right? Not so in this day. I want us to look at it. It was one of the most exciting times in the community that there was. First, in these weddings, there was a step of betrothal. The bridegroom would give a piece of paper to, uh, that would legally tie the two together, but for a considerable time afterwards, the bride would remain in the house of her family. Then on the wedding night, the bride would be led from her father's house to that of her husband's 
with a procession following them in the way. And many people would join in the procession and follow them on the way to the bride's to the bridegroom's house. Okay. Now, a solemn prayer would be uttered, the ceremonial washing of hands would take place, and then the party would really begin. Oftentimes, these festivals lasted for over a week, and we know according to these verses of Scripture, there was a lot of drinking and laughing take place. I'm, I, we'll get to it in just a minute, but a lot of the weddings that I'm asked to do these days, I don't want a church wedding. I find that interesting. They want it at a different venue at some place because most of the time, some things are going to take place at that wedding that the church would not allow to have take place. Amen? That's enough said about that, okay? So anyway, here we, we find this most joyous occasion, and we find that Jesus was here. Now, what's the point, Brother Rick? The, the point is this, that our Lord was a happy Lord. Amen? Yes. People have this idea of Jesus being this sad, prune-faced man of sorrows all the time. And even though he did have some sorrow in his life, i got to believe most of the time he was a happy Savior. Amen? He was in the middle of this wedding. It was a time of great joy, and he and his followers were there. That tells me, listen, if Jesus can be excited and happy about something, we as his followers should be the same. Amen. we got a lot to be happy and rejoice over, amen? amen. So much that we have so. I wonder sometimes, we as believers, we ought to be the most joyful people on the planet. Amen? Yes. Our sins have been forgiven, been wiped away, tossed into the depths of the sea. We've been given His Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance. We've got the Spirit, Holy Spirit within us to help us every day of the week. We've got His Word to guide us. We can speak to Him every day. We ought to be the happiest people on the planet. But oftentimes, listen to me, oftentimes we look like we've been sucking on persimmons. We do. I think what's in our heart ought to make it to our face every once in a while. Right. Amen. Right. So we ought to be happy. Jesus was happy. The Bible says in Luke 7, he came drinking and eating. He was a happy Christ. He was a laughing Lord. He drank of the joys of life, and you and I should do the same. That was the occasion. The occasion was a wedding. But I want us to see something else. I want us to see an obstacle that happens in verse 3. Right in the middle of what would be one of the most joyous occasions of all time, there was a dark shadow cast over it because there was a problem that came up. There was an obstacle that took place, okay? Wine was an essential part of that culture in that day. And in a, bride, in, in a wedding feast, for someone to run out of wine was a huge embarrassment. It probably said there wasn't much planning on the part of the wedding planner, amen, to run out of wine. So this was very critical. In other words, what would have been a, a great celebration, and we don't know for sure. We don't know who all was here. We do know that Mary was there. According to the text, she probably had some big part in the wedding. She might have been what we would call the wedding planner. I'm not sure. But she was there, and Jesus was there, and in the middle of the joy and the happiness, there was this thing of an obstacle that they ran out of wine, and I want you to know immediately what Mary did. She looked at Jesus and said, they're out of wine. Notice how quick she did that. We're going to look at that in depth a little bit more. Many times in the midst of our most joyous occasions in our life, there's an obstacle that comes and casts a dark shadow over our lives. Listen to these, just a few. The joy of marriage is often shattered by unfaithfulness. The joy of parenthood can be shattered by a problem child. The joy of success is sometimes shattered by failure. The joy of carefully laid plans can be shattered by an unexpected turn of events in our lives. And how often we have to admit it sometimes it rains on our parade. Amen. Life, even for the Christian, is not all fun and games that produces joy and laughter all the time. There are obstacles that come into our lives that the Lord has to deal with. And sometimes, if we're not careful, those obstacles will take our joy away. 
I told the Sunday school class a couple of weeks ago, the thing that'll take your joy away most in life will be other people. <laughs> Ever notice how that is? Man, you can be having a great day and somebody just cross the line just a little bit, just say something just a little bit out of line. That good day is gone, amen? <laughs> it happens. Our, our little parade gets upset when things don't go just our way. So there was this obstacle at the wedding. I find it's, it's interesting as we follow this text to get a real translation of how it goes very quickly. It's somewhat hard to follow. When, when she looked at him and to Jesus and said, we're out of wine, which would naturally the mother would expect Jesus to do something, amen. I mean, she knew who he was. She knew what he was capable of. But I, I want you to notice something else. The omnipotence of the Lord here. Verse 3, Mary says, we've got no wine. And Jesus' response to her is, listen to this, woman, what have I to do with thee? Y'all get that? That's what it says right here. Now, we would look at that at face value and say, Jesus was rude to his mother. Amen. Well, you were looking at that originally. No, that would have been a sin on his part. And guess what? He never sinned. Woman was a term of endearment, by the way. And what he wanted her to see, if you literally look at the translation here, he said, woman, what to me? That's the way it translates. Jesus was looking at it completely different than Mary looked at it. Mary was looking at, I need somebody to do something for me quick right now on the spot. And Jesus was saying, Mary, you don't understand. I came to be the redeemer of mankind. Not just to do your bidding whenever you ask me to. I've got more on my mind. I come to seek and to save that which was lost. I come to give abundant life to those who would come to me. I've got a lot more on my mind than just fulfilling somebody's whim of asking me to do something whenever they need it done. That was the omnipotence of Jesus. What to you and me? He was worried about being man's redeemer more than doing a miracle that they needed at the time. And our Lord is omnipotent. Amen. Amen. He knows all. He sees all. He knows everything that goes on within us. We're going to get, I told class this week, a couple weeks ago, we're going to stand someday and we're going to give an account, listen to this, for every idle word that we say. I don't know about you, Blake. That cuts me to the heart. That's very convicting. Because we say a lot of things that don't honor the Lord. Amen. We truly do. So there was this omnipotence. What do you and me? I'm more interested in being man's redeemer. And I, know, I want you to notice this. Once he called that to point, Jesus did exactly what he asked her to. Or what she asked him to do. Notice that. He was going to fulfill the need. He was going to meet the need, if you will. Okay? And by the way, I want us to understand, Jesus is in the need-meeting business. Amen? Amen? You ever met a need in your life? Yes. Hey, I like it when people talk back to me. When I preach, you get to talk back to me, okay? Here in a little bit, you're really going to get to talk back to me. Ever had a need in your life Jesus met? Amen. Yes. Man, the greatest need of our life was salvation, amen? amen? He met that need. He met it abundantly. He even said, I want to save you to the uttermost. See, when he does something, he does it first class. Amen? Jesus can meet needs in our life. Been sick, down and out. The Lord do a miracle in your life. Bring healing to your life. A lot of things that the Lord can do with omnipotence. There was a need and Jesus made it. I thought about that through some of the gospel accounts. There was a woman that came to Jesus in John chapter 4 to get water at the well. The Samaritan lady, you remember how the saying goes, she came looking for water. Jesus made a need in her life because she went on with a well that was springing up in her soul. Amen. Jesus was out on the ship with the disciples and a big storm came up. They're fearful. They think they're going down. Amen. They called for Jesus. Jesus only said three words. Amen. Right? Say it. Peace be still. Y'all are great Bible students. I want you preaching back to me. Amen. Peace be still. He met their need just that quick. What about that lady who came to him? Listen to this. 
who had an issue of blood for 12 years, spent all the money she had going to doctors to no avail. And in the midst of that crowd that day, she touched the hem of his garment and was cured immediately. He met her need, amen. Has he met some needs in your life? He met some needs in my life as a 13-year-old boy, Steve. In a revival meeting at Second Baptist Church, I'll never forget it. The Lord spoke to me, did a work in my heart, and literally, listen to this, at 13, transformed my life. I didn't know much about what life was about until he came in. And then I began to look at life in a whole different way. A whole different perspective came about. So Jesus is the need meter. He has the power to transform into a person's life. He transforms their life. He takes that which was flat and dull and tasteless and makes it sparkling and exciting. The omnipotent one has the power to meet every need that we have and overcome every obstacle and satisfy the longing of our soul. Listen, you'll never know peace in this world apart from Jesus Christ. Until you know the Prince of Peace, you're never going to have peace in your life. Never. That's a need that only he can meet. And when he meets these needs, he does it. First class. So Jesus tells her, what have I would do with you? Then he looks at the overabundance. Let's look at the overabundance in this story. There are water pots there for the purifying of the Jews. Six stone pots. They say Perkins, if you translate that into English, that's about 30 gallons. Okay? So do the math with me real quick in your head. You got six pots of 30. How many gallons? 180. You got 180 gallons. Amen? 180 gallons. Now listen. Jesus made 180 gallons of wine. Just like that. Are you ready? Now, I will be the first one to tell you, and I want you to please understand this, okay? I don't know anything about wine. I'm glad I don't. Amen? Amen? Yes. I don't know anything about alcohol, period. <laughs> Amen? I'm glad I don't. I'm glad the Lord delivered me from that thing that I see destroy so many people's lives. So I don't really know about all this thing about alcohol and wine, but I'm told here that he, he made 180 gallons, and he met their need, and he met it abundantly. You see, Jesus can do things far exceedingly abundantly above what we think or ask. Oftentimes, we pray for little things, and God wants us to pray for big things. Amen? He can meet the big needs in our life. You say, Brother Rick, there's no need to bother the Lord with the little things in our life. Oh, yes, there is. It's all big to Him. You're one of His children. Amen? It's all big. So, we, here we have here the overabundance. He makes 180 gallons, more than they can drink in 10 wedding parties at one place. He met their need abundantly. Now, I, I've been told about this thing of alcohol. I don't know it to be true, but I've been told this, and perhaps you know better than me. Even the, the governor of the feast noticed this as well as you get to it in just a moment. That whatever Jesus did was better than what the people that set the, the wedding up did, okay? The idea was this, that when you start the wedding feast, you put the best stuff out first, right? You with me? Whatever the best stuff is. And when men have well drunken, right? When men are more intoxicated, is that the word we use? <laughs> then you throw the cheap stuff out, right? Why? Why, somebody? They don't know the difference. They're, are, they're already inebriated, amen? So it doesn't matter to them as long as it's something to drink. But the governor noticed something different about this. You see, when Jesus did it, he did it first class. He took blade, he took some top shelf wine. <laughs> 180 gallons. It's interesting when you look at the story here. We don't know exactly when that water became wine, but it did. We don't know if it became wine the minute they poured it in the stone pots. We don't know if it became wine the minute the cupbearer bore it out to give it to the governor. We're not, we're not told in this example of Scripture here. But we do know that the Lord Jesus worked abundantly. The wine that Jesus produced was better than the wine they had to begin with. There's an old hymn that makes me think of that. I even sang it to myself out on my screen in porch one day this week. So I don't drink alcohol out there, but I do drink a lot of Dr. Peppers out there. <laughs> Y'all remember this old song? Steve, you'll remember this. 
Might even want to sing it with me. Every day with Jesus. Say it. Every day with Jesus. I love you. got it. Keep on singing. Jesus saves and keeps me. He's the one I'm living for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Isn't that not true? Is that not true? Even on our worst day, it's still good. Amen. Sometimes I get to complain and whining. And my wife, bless her heart, of 48 years this summer will look at me and say, what do you think you got to whine about? You got it pretty good. She keeps me in line, man. No reason for you to be down and out. We're so blessed if we just sit back and count it. Jesus met this need with the overabundance. Now, there's something else I want us to see in the story. I want us to see the obedience that takes place here. Some reading this story might complain, why, why is the power of God not displayed in my life the way it is here? The answer is in verse 5. Mary looked at him. Look with me in verse 5. His mother said unto them, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Okay? So there's an element here that we need to understand. It's the element of obedience. The miracle and transformation took place, listen, only when the people obeyed what Jesus told them to do. The Bible is very clear. He desires obedience more than sacrifice. Amen. Okay? He wants our obedience. Okay? And you can't just be partial, partial obedient unto the Lord. Partial obedience means what? Yes, if your kid was only partial obedient, would you say he was obedient? No. no. You'd say he's a self-willed child, amen, and he's disobedient. There's an obedience in this verse. Mary said, whatever Jesus says to you, do it. In verse 7, Jesus said, fill the water pots. You get that? What's the next phrase say? Somebody read it to me out loud. And they did it, right? And they filled the water pots. What's the, ne what's the next thing that he says? Huh? What's the next thing? Draw it out to the governor. Okay? We're talking about obedience here. Now, just for a second, I want to veer off course just for a moment. In 1971, I was a 15-year-old boy growing up in the little town of Litchfield. I loved chemistry class. I don't know what there was about it. There's something about chemistry that intrigued me. And I, I researched chemistry enough as a 15-year-old boy that un unknown to Miss Holt, our teacher, I would try to find these chemicals that had a really big reaction <laughs> when you mixed them together in a beaker. See, I had to admit there's a little bit of pyrotechnician weight out in there <laughs> at 15. Maybe that's true at every boy at 15, I don't know, but it certainly was for me. And I didn't want to try to find things. I didn't want to blow up and hurt anybody, don't get me wrong. I didn't want to cause a fire, but I wanted some fireworks, so to speak. I wanted to see some smoke, okay? So I'm all the time following these formulas to try to get a, a, a reaction that the teacher did not like. <laughs> I, did, I, I made A's in chemistry. I don't know how I did that, but I did. That was in the days when you also had to dissect a frog. Y'all okay, remember those days? Here's the idea. People have to be obedient. Most of the time, we are not willing to be obedient unto the Lord for Him to work mightily in our lives. We're just not willing to pay the price. It's going to cost us something if we're going to be obedient to the Lord. Now, if I was performing a chemistry experiment, and y'all are thanking God I'm not doing that this morning, okay? If I were to perform one and I would simply give you an equation like this, tell me what the answer would be. A plus B plus C equals D. A plus B plus C equals D. Now let's say if I did A plus B Equals what? C. Does it equal C? Or does it equal D? No, it doesn't. Why? Say it out loud. I did not follow the formula. 
Nothing wrong with the formula. I just failed to follow the formula, okay? I did not get the result. The problem was not with the formula. The problem was with me. And most of the time, the problem is with us. Amen? We got this idea that if we follow the Lord and we're obedient, there's never going to be any joy in our lives. Nothing can be further from the truth. Right. He's what joy is all about in our lives. And we can't obey him one minute and disobey the next. It just doesn't work that way. So, we find that in a Christian life, these people, they want to obey, they want to obey certain things and neglect other things. I've heard people say Christians want to live their life like smorgasbord. Y'all remember what the old smorgasbord days were like? Y'all do? You remember? You just went through and pick and choose what you want, right? What you don't want, you leave behind. That's not the way the Christian life works. I'm sorry to tell you it's not. If we want to, we have to obey Christ. Even if that means sometimes we have to turn our back on certain things. When I got saved at 13, guess what? I had to become a different person, and I became a different person. I didn't, I didn't no longer, as the teenage years came along, I didn't do the things that most of my buddies did. You're called an oddball and square if you don't do that. That's about the worst that will ever come of it, right? But I'm thankful that I tried to obey. And I had a mom and daddy that taught me and trained me well and reared me right and pointed me in the right direction about everything. I tell people all the time, I got to see their Christian life lived out in person every day of my life as a young boy growing up. Now, I can't tell you what that will do for you way down deep in here. It will really shape your life into something. It really will. So the Lord and parents have made me the person I have become. And it may not be much, but I'm thankful for what it is. Amen. When we do not experience the peace and joy that Jesus promised, we throw up our hands and we say, Christianity doesn't work for me. You did not follow the formula. Okay? Are you ready? Here is the formula. Here is the spiritual formula. The fault is with us, not the formula. Here's the formula. Are you ready? Repentance plus acceptance plus obedience equals eternal life. Amen. That's as simple as you can you put it, amen. You follow those three steps in the formula and you get the end result of life. You know what the thing about? We don't have to wait till we get to heaven to enjoy eternal life. We can enjoy it right now. Yes. The very minute we got saved, we got the best there was to get, amen. And we can enjoy it right here in the right now. We don't have to wait until then. So the formula, if you do the formula, the formula works. But most of us are not willing to do the formula. It's going to cost me something if I do. They followed it. The governor said, hey, man, you, you held out on us. You saved the best for last. No, it's just that Jesus did it. Amen. And whatever he does, he does first class. There's no doubt about that. So here, listen to this. Repentance, acceptance, and obedience, that's the formula, and it works every time. But you have to obey. Obedience is necessary, listen, for the omnipotent Christ to work in your life, and he will transform your life if you will allow him to. Amen. He's in the transforming business. That's what he does. He takes that which is lifeless and dull and brings it to life and makes it vibrant. His transforming miracle can take place in your life today. I'm going to tell you something. He's here. He's ready. And he's certainly able to transform your life today. Amen. Amen. Are you with me? Here's the deal you got to do. You've you got to want to have your life transformed. Amen. I said to Brother Frelich, the only thing we had anything to do with salvation was saying I need it and I want it. Everything else God did. That's why it's not a works salvation, amen? It's a grace salvation. So he's ready right now, willing and able to meet every need of your life. He's ready. The question is this. Are you? Are you ready? Man, he met that need. Mary didn't understand what she was asking Jesus at this point. All I know, Jesus was concerned about the salvation of mankind more than he was about having wine at a wedding. She had, her, she had it a little bit backwards. But however, he did fulfill her request, and the party continued 
And it was even better at the ending than it was at the start. And it's a picture of what Jesus does in your life. You may be here today. Listen, you, you've never had your life transformed by Jesus. And I'm talking about transforming. I'm talking about old things pass away and everything else becomes new. Amen. That's what the Bible tells us. When we get saved, we become a brand new creation. Amen. So today, that might be the greatest need in your life. The greatest need in your life, listen, might be drawn back closer to the Lord than you are right now. We, we have a word. We don't say it much. Your word in Baptist life. We used to hear it a lot years ago, didn't we? Mm -hmm. What word was that? Backslidden. You got it. You might be here this morning and you might be back. I thought I put her on the spot. I knew she had the right answer. <laughs> you might be backslidden. Hey, listen. The things of the Lord right now may not be exciting to you as it was 10 years ago. Yeah. Why not? Why not? The Lord didn't change. Mm -mm. Amen. Right. He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, forever. He didn't change. Yeah. What happened? You changed. We changed. Maybe the Lord's got a calling on your life. Even in a young guy, it can happen. Amen? I, I, it's funny how as, as you get a little older in life, you can see sometimes the calling of God's on other people that they can't see themselves. Isn't that funny how that is? Growing up as a young man in the church, I grew up as a layman in my early 20s. Everybody in that church thought they knew I was going to be a preacher one day. But I didn't see it. And finally, one of my mentors that we've been talking about in Sunday school, one of my mentors set me down and said, Rick, when are you going to do what God put you on this planet to do? And I said, what's that? <laughs> As though I didn't know. <laughs> the truth is, I knew. <laughs> Amen. Everybody else saw it. I didn't want to see it. Yeah. And as a result of that, I ran away from that calling for five whole years. <laughs> Whew. Hard to be disobedient for five years when you don't do what the Lord asks you to do. Those were miserable five years. My wife knew what I was going through. I remember the first time I told her, I think the Lord's coming to preach. Don't want to embarrass her. The first thing she said was, I didn't marry a preacher. <laughs> I said, no, ma'am, you didn't. But you're going to have to take it up with Jesus now. That's all I can tell you. And it worked out. It worked out. We've been together for 48 years. Amen. It always works out. What's the need of your life today? Whatever it is, I just want you to know, Jesus stands ready, willing, and able to meet that need. Are you willing and able? We're going to go into an invitation. Stand with me, heads bowed, eyes closed. Steve comes, the group comes. Blake will be here. Brother Charles will be here to receive you. I want to say a quick prayer for us. Then we'll go into an invitation hymn. Father, thank you for the time we've had this morning. I pray that your sheep have been fed. The Lord, now is decision time. Now it's time for the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do. To woo and draw and convict. Lord, I pray today if there's a decision that needs to be made, it would be made. That they would be obedient today to your call in their life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing, you come. This is the
about it today. Maybe you won't walk down an aisle this morning, but right where you stand, you'd say, Brother Rick, there's a need in my life. Would you pray with me? Would you want to meet that need, whatever it might be? Anybody in here? Hand up right back down. Got a huge need in my life. I know the Lord can meet it. He's in the need meeting business. The Lord does his deepest work in silence, I think. Just waiting on him. Listen to his voice. Obey what he says. Sing one more verse. Let's do it. This is the air I breathe. Thank you for your attendance, your attention. It's been a joy to preach to you.